So first up uh, this afternoon, uh, we've got one of two detector talks uh, by Kieran, who's been invited to talk about um, future detectors for high-resolution imaging. Okay, yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me along to give this talk. I must admit, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too sure when in preparing this talk exactly which direction to take it, and, uh, and especially seeing as there are some, uh, a lot more people in the audience who are experts in the actual imaging, in the uh, high-resolution imaging than I am. I don't work in high-resolution imaging. Maybe I should be very upfront about this. I work on high-time-resolution observations of X-ray binaries. Probably the only time that's going to be mentioned today. Right, but <laughs> I would like to say thanks very much for all of the you know, fantastic introduction talks because um, what, I, what I plan to do in this talk, really, is, uh, is, is answer sort of four questions, if you like. What is high-resolution imaging? We had all those fantastic talks this morning. I will just summarize them. But I'll summarize my, my sort of goal of that aspect is really to, to look at um, what does that lead to the requirements for detectors, for existing detectors and, de and future uh, detectors. Um, what is the current status? And then I'll also talk about, uh, uh, about what is on the horizon. And I apologize for all those people whose, whose uh, sort of areas and projects that I, I overlook, okay, from here on out, basically. And I'll try not to talk, uh, stand on Paul Jordan's toes too much as well, but I'm sure he'll have some fantastic uh, uh, slides to show next. Okay. I think, and this is where I, again, start with this sort of, hope I don't miss out anybody's uh, uh, area. I think sort of I, from what we saw this morning and, uh, and from, you know, my general background, I think there are four main areas of, uh, of high-resolution imaging. There's the adaptive optic side, there's interferometry, sparse aperture marks, maybe a branch of interferometry, I'm not sure, but I think it's distinct enough to be up there, and then this idea of lucky imaging. And they're all, you know, related to, to, uh, to how we... Um, how we overcome some of the atmospheric and uh, 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 issues that we have around the, you know, the effects of the atmosphere and turbulence in the atmosphere. And, uh, and get down to these, you know, as high resolution imaging as, as we can in order to increase, as we say, with the increase in aperture of large telescopes, you get this D to the four uh, increase in sensitivity, or hopefully a D to the four increase in sensitivity with increasing uh, diameter of telescopes. So in terms of an actual, so as I say, I'm just gonna sort of uh, try and uh, and run through um, a few of the different sort of flavors of adaptive optics and give a little bit of an overview of, uh, of, of some, of the, um, some of the concepts and some of the, uh, the requirements that flow down from these. Okay, and I'll be, uh, I'll be making extensive use of the ESO web pages and, uh, and also input from Tim Morris, the session chair. So, okay. so we'll start with the most simple, really is, you know, is single conjugate adaptive optics. Okay, this is the first uh, star really of adaptive optics that was put onto large telescopes. It, uh, you observe a star on axis and use that in order to, to correct the, uh, the distortions in the wavefront uh, with, a, with a wavefront sensor. Um, it, you know, in terms of then what I, is a, maybe I've got a laser here. Yeah, okay. So in terms of the, uh, the science focal plane array, then really, you know, we have a relatively small field of view. These are largely for single object uh, observations, so we don't need a large field of view, we don't need a large number of pixels in our focal plane array. They're relatively bright objects, so again, we, you know, so we, they're, um, they were sort of demanding, let's say, on some of the first generation of detectors of focal plane arrays that we used, but nowadays, you know, you can get a large number of, uh, of focal plane arrays that, that would uh, satisfy the uh, requirements for this type of observation. <coughs> Okay, in terms of the wavefront sensor, again, there's two sort of uh, regimes that are used. You can either use a, a, an infrared wavefront sensor or do your wavefront sensing in the visible. And, uh, and these both need sort of low noise and moderate speed in the IR. But as we saw earlier about Mavis, then, um, you know, we're, we're talking about needing kilohertz sort of frame rates to push the wavefront sensing down into the, into the visible. Okay. Uh, a slight sort of uh, change on that, and one of the other ones we heard about this morning again is, is ground layer AO. This is a seeing enhancement technique, basically. You use uh, several wavefront sensors connected to a single DM, or maybe uh, a couple of DMs, 
But you're, you're really just trying to do over a broad uh, field of view, uh, uh, a seeing enhancement, maybe you know, halving the, uh, the full width half max of the, uh, of, the, of the profile. So for this we have, in contrast to the previous one, a large field of view for the science focal plane array. And as we've seen with some of the other sort of ideas for tip-tilt corrections and things, you know, very large field of view. For the wavefront sensor, again, we have quite a large field of view for uh, using a Shaq Hartman wavefront sensor for this system. Sort of challenging, but not too challenging frame rates, but also, you know, yet again, this idea of, of low noise. Low noise is best in, in everything. Okay. MCAO. Uh, similar, but uh, in this case, we, we do have multiple uh, uh, DMs. We have multiple... Con multiple conjugate planes, so we're correcting the atmosphere at, uh, at more than one altitude, and uh, and and using this as a uh, to give you a larger field of view. In this case, you do need uh, quite high speed for the residual correction uh, in your potentially in your uh, in your science focal plane array. So this would be any sort of residual tip tilt could uh, make use of the high uh, high speed detector, and for the uh, but for the wavefront sensor, again, you have a moderate field of view and relatively slow speeds for this, uh, for this type of system. LTAO. The first uh, sort of one of a, a tomographic AO. Um, and I haven't got any requirements for this, apparently. I'm not quite sure what I'm having to. Um, but uh, these will be similar to the, uh, to the previous system. And finally, the... Um, the uh, the last one, not quite last actually, but uh, MOAO, which is multi-object adaptive optics. This is the uh, sort of the next great thing. It's a sort of bit of what you fancy mode. Well, I did actually have a maybe. Not sure. It's always call it the sort of Brexit mode. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for it, because it was sold as being something for everyone, and it's getting more and more complicated by the day. And we'll have to reserve judgment on the success or failure for at least a decade. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Too much coffee. Right. Um, and the requirements for this then are typically, you know, you would use a, a um, the focal plane array, you would ideally use, uh, and it would be built for an IFU so that you can uh, get the maximum amount of information from these sort of very varied sources that you have in the field of view. That in turn requires very high sensitivity, which in turn sort of means low noise for the science focal plane array. Um, and these would be sort of distributed IFUs around the field of view, potentially. For the wavefront sensor, uh, there's a large field of view, 500 kilohertz, uh, 500 hertz, sorry, uh, frame rates and low noise. And finally, for the adaptive optics, uh, is the uh, extreme adaptive optics. This is basically a, a sort of an extreme version, hence the name, of, the, of an SCAO system with a higher actuator density and faster correction, okay, to get your, your extreme adaptive optics. Uh, typically, again, the, uh, the, wave for the um, focal plane array would be an IFU, which is required for a lot of sort of post-processing to get the uh, enhanced um, uh, contrast ratios that you require for getting down to these uh, very faint or very high contrast. Um, and for this, you would need, you know, really quite extreme uh, wavefront sensors. And this is something that at the moment I don't think is, is, is an open issue, basically, at the moment. It's not been solved. Uh, even with the current generation of, of, um, of detectors for XAO systems for the next generation telescopes for the ELTs and things with these, uh, with these uh, even higher frame rates than we currently can achieve. Okay, so that was it for sort of adaptive optics. So as you can see, you know, there's, there's a range uh, of, of different, uh, different requirements that flow down from them. I'll summarize them in a little bit later, but... Uh, but as you can see, you know, the, what we can do is driven by the technology largely, or is limited by the technology, whichever way you look at it. Um, and so advances in terms of going to large telescopes, uh, higher actuator density and things like this onto formable mirrors and is, is really going to be sort of limited by what you can do with the wavefront sensing. Uh, I think we've got another talk this afternoon on interferometry. Uh, just a little sort of, you know, by interferometry here, I'm sort of really referring to <coughs> interferometry where you, you use, you know, an, in, in the optical, uh, where you use a, a, um, a delay line 
to uh, to interfere the the um, the beams here. You can see you know a little uh, sketch of what it would look like. I'm not sure which one of this was VLTI or whatever it was. But uh, your two telescopes with your delay lines here and corrections finally being um, uh, combined in this combining room in the centre, which is where you place your instruments. And here you have the typical thing you would see on your uh, on your uh, focal plane array which is the light coming, in this case, from three of the UTs and then the combined light in terms of the VLTI in the center there. As you can see from this, you know, really you're going to need uh, as low signal to noise. These are, these are faint um, signatures. This is actually, I think, a five I think I read a five-second integration, whereas actually for uh, typical science observations, you would go an order of magnitude faster than that, so you can really see that you'll be struggling for, uh, for signal to noise. And... Because of the, the limitations in the delay lines and things, you're, you're really limited at the moment to the infrared. So you want all of these, these low noise, fast, and in the infrared. <coughs> but you only need a small field of view. Okay, uh, similar thing for the sparse aperture mask, which we, we had just heard about um, uh, from Sasha. Uh, then... Um, <coughs> This works again, well, here at the introduction, as you see, I, this is just a simple figure I took from somewhere that, uh, that shows you what you're doing with sort of two apertures and how you combine them, and these are the visibilities that you get. This is, you know, how you, you can, uh, what sort of size scales and, and things you can observe. And then by, even by the time you go to sort of three apertures, then uh, you're starting to see, you know, that you can, you can resolve uh, some of these features. In a typical system, you'd have, maybe it would be corrected, sort of tens of, of, uh, of these sub-apertures in a, in a mask, maybe up to a sort of 100. These have a relatively small field of view, as you can see, but maybe they would benefit from, from an IFU. Uh, there is a chromatic effect in here and some sort of fast readout. Okay. And lastly, uh, lucky imaging, which we just heard about before lunch. This is one of the uh, Gravity Cam images from their website. And uh, here you can see the, the improvement you can get uh, from using the uh, this, uh, Gravity, Cam, uh, Gravity Cam instrument or a similar sort of system, uh, whereby you, you basically shift and add to remove the tip tilt uh, and other terms, if you can, uh, to, increase, to improve your final resolution of the images. You need a, a wide field of view. Some of these are in extremely wide field of views, or as we've heard, up to 100 EMC CDs in a focal plane. A high frame rate, again about 25 hertz, and for that reason, really a, a low noise as well. Uh, because by the time you're adding lots and lots of frames, then obviously you're adding lots and lots of uh, readout noise contribution. Okay, so what does this give us? Well. As I said, what I wanted to sort of uh, try and highlight by just going very quickly through those, uh, summarizing those, those uh, aspects of sort of high resolution imaging, is that there are a range of requirements that flow down from those. And these are fairly broad, and each you know, uh, application will have its own sort of subset of these. <coughs> but you know, we, we have the usual suspects, basically. We have the sensitivity, which we, you, know, you can also think about in terms of sort of naively as a, a quantum efficiency. We have the noise you know, array size, well, as you can see. And finally, the last one would be, you know, that uh, certainly in the case of high contrast imaging, you know, the spectroscopy via an IFU. We want everything. We want the perfect detector, basically, is what we're saying. Okay? So the next question is, how are we doing, and how can we maybe get towards that perfect detector? <coughs> This is my view of these things, by the way. I should say, you know, I take all responsibility, all or no responsibility, I'm not sure, for, for what appears up here. This is my interpretation of things. It's, it's difficult because, you know, CCDs, what are you talking about in terms of maybe field or, or cost per unit? Are you talking about a big 4K squared detector or, you know, it's open to a lot of interpretation. But what I'm trying to do is sort of draw your eye to uh, how we're doing in moving towards the, the perfect detector. So, you know, we started off with uh, something that's relatively free. I don't know. I have kids. I guess they're not free. But uh, um, and then we moved from photographic plates down towards, you know, more electronic means of, uh, of, of measuring the light. 
This led to, you know, a large improvement in sensitivity, some improvement in noise, not, not a lot of improvement in time resolution unless you start to, to get towards some of these other solutions down the bottom here which are, are trying to sort of <coughs> regain some of that speed and sensitivity from uh, what was lost in the sort of, you know, first generations at least of CCDs where this wouldn't have been seconds, this would have been, you know, tens of seconds or minutes. I'll come back to that. Uh, an array size here, you know, how big can we make these things? Uh, you know, these, these really are some of these CCDs in the, the Mercatel arrays. I mean, they're, they're amazing, the size you can get nowadays. And the cost, cost is changing all the time. Um, but, you know, a lot of these are still limited. You know, the, if you want more green boxes over here, then this goes red. Basically, is how it works. And, uh, okay. So... I'll just go through a few of the um, a few of the detectors that we have. Okay, uh, a few of the detectors I think maybe people have mentioned today, just to give you some sort of a bit of a flavour. But as I say, Paul Jordan will be up next and, and talking about this a lot more. Current detectors really are excellent. They are approaching the perfect detector, you know, at least in a lot of senses. Okay. When you think of something like this, Hawaii 4RG, 16 million pixels, all of them with a very high QE. It's a near-infrared array. The cosmetic quality is very, very good. You know, they uh, work, you know, over a reasonable passband all the way through the infrared and in pushing down towards the visible. Okay. But they're not cheap. Uh, sorry, uh, let's say, next one was another one that um, I think we've seen today, or maybe not yet, um, was CCD220. This is uh, one for wavefront sensing. It's a smaller array. You don't anymore get the large sort of megapixel arrays, but it goes at kilohertz frame rates, which is what it was designed to do for wavefront sensing. It has low noise, but non-zero. Okay, a very high QE, and you know it's basically it's a visible EMCCD. Its infrared equivalent for wavefront sensing is arguably the uh, Sephira array. Sorry, I haven't put it up here. The Leonardo Sephira array. Um, it's a similar sort of size. It's, again, it's not a megapixel array. Kilohertz frame rates, again, sub-electron, similar to the CCD, electron read noise, maybe even a little bit worse, uh, but works in the infrared. And these are very exciting uh, devices as well, which uh, I think was touched on, on earlier. And finally, one that uh, was mentioned in the, in the gravity cam sort of thing earlier as well, again, uh, is the CCD220 as a sort of early potential uh, candidate for their focal plane array. And this is a megapixel EMCCD, which uh, I worked on EMCCDs before with uh, ultraspec and things, and this is, you know, this is really impressive. Okay. Maybe I have any else to have on it? was bad. So, again, okay. Uh, Here's the, the table again. So this is it. So as I say, these are some of these ones we saw, the APD array there, the Sephira, the CCD220, so the Hawaii 4RG, and, uh, and a CCD in there as well. Okay. So have we achieved that perfect detector? Maybe not. Because there's one of these columns that's still clear. Well, maybe, actually. This was an interesting thing that came up at SPIE uh, last year for those people that were there is that maybe you can hope to squeeze out a bit of energy resolution from, the, uh, from an uh, Sephira array, but that's still to be TBD. I would argue that we have not found the perfect detector, but I would like to now spend uh, the next bit of my talk talking about one potential candidate, which for those of you in the room who know me won't be surprised in the slightest little bit. Uh, and this is MKIDS. These are kinetic inductance detectors. These are a superconducting detector they're a pair-breaking superconducting detector, which are sensitive in the, amongst other places, in the visible and near-infrared. And the amazing thing about these is they count individual photons, but as well as counting the uh, arrival time of the photon to around about a microsecond, you also get a measurement of the energy of the photon to, of order, at a moment, sort of 5 to 10 percent. So an energy resolution around 10 to 20 so for the astronomers in the audience, that's somewhere between broadband and narrowband imaging, that sort of resolution at the moment. Okay. Uh, and that's on a, but that's on a photon by photon basis. And so I'll now go in a little bit into, uh, into how they do this and then come back to um, 
uh, some of the applications for them in terms of high resolution imaging. So here we have our, as I say, it is a superconductor. Okay, it's a superconductor that you place in a, in a resonance circuit here. This is the, the inductive and capacitive part of a small resonance circuit here, where the inductor is actually a superconductor. Okay, and what happens is as a, as a photon comes in, it breaks Cooper pairs. This is just an energy diagram. So here we have this sort of gap energy of a superconductor. This is, if you want, the sort of binding energy of a Cooper pair. And what happens is the, the photon comes in, breaks a Cooper pair, and which uh, generates a, a very hot uh, electrons, which then generate more and more, break more and more Cooper pairs. Okay. And the good thing about this is this, this energy, in, in, you know, in contrast to the um, photoelectric effect where a photon comes in and generates a single photoelectron, in the case of a superconductor with the energy gap here, is many thousands of times smaller than the, than the uh, semiconductor band gap. And what it means is that uh, instead of just breaking, instead of generating a single photoelectron, you actually generate many, many tens of thousands of uh, what we call quasi particles, these excitations in a superconducting lattice. Okay? And it's this fact that you may generate many, many thousands is the way that you can actually then sense the energy. Okay? This, this violet kinetic inductance effect changes the inductance in this circuit, which changes the resonant frequency of that circuit, and you can sense that. Okay? And the magnitude of that change, uh, let me just put that up, the magnitude of that change is actually related to the number of Cooper pairs that you broke. And if you have a photon that comes in with half of the energy, you break half of the number of Cooper pairs to first order, and you get the effect is half the size. So you can then, how well you can determine that, uh, that, uh, that energy change is, is how well you can determine the energy of the incoming <coughs> photon, just with some, you know, some idea of the average binding energy of that Cooper pair. Okay. And the reason these are called microwave kinetic inductance detectors is that these frequencies are tuned to be of order in the microwave regime in the order of sort of four to eight gigahertz, which is, uh, enables us to use a, a uh, well, I'll come on to that in a second. So what do we see from a single photon event? What we happen is if we have a, a tone that we, uh, that we put down into the cryostat here uh, it, and um, uh, excites this, resonate, this resonance, then what happens is as the, photo, as the photon comes in, breaks many Cooper pairs, it changes this resonant frequency. So it goes from this solid line to this dashed line and what we can determine that is as a phase shift between the input signal and the output signal. Okay? And what happens is then if we're looking at that phase shift between those two signals, we see this very fast rise as the, as the photon interacts. And then as the Cooper pairs recombine, then you go back to your solid, uh, solid state, your steady state uh, solution here. Okay? And this happens, as you can see, in the order of a few tens of microseconds. Okay? And as I say, the amplitude of this event is basically to tell you something about the energy of the incoming photon. So what we can look at is that for, for individual events, if we take a histogram, if we put in many, many photons uh, from uh, a monochromatic source, so we know the energy of the incoming photons, we measure the out, you know, our measured energy, plot a histogram of that, the width of this tells us how well we can determine the energy of the, uh, of the photon from the, with this uh, particular device. Okay. And in this case, this is, um, this is quite old now, but this, is, this has an energy resolution of around about 15 at 250 nanometers. Okay, so again, just gives you some sort of idea. Of the, uh, okay. Now, this is what a, one of these pixels actually looks like. So this is our little resonant circuit. We have a capacity, maybe I'd have seen this sort of interdigitated capacitor here and an inductive meander here. And it's coupled to a feed line. Okay, so this is our, our little circuit here. You know, we have this <coughs> coupling capacitor coupled to a feed line, inductor, capacitor, okay? And, uh, and that you can see here on a, in this, micro, in this, um, this uh, microscope image. Now, the big thing about kinetic inductance detectors compared to many other uh, superconducting, well, many of the other superconducting detectors like transition edge sensors and superconducting tunnel junction devices is that we can actually, uh, we have a way of, of making many, many of these uh, 
pixels of these on a single feed line. So we can make large arrays of these, basically. A lot of other superconducting detectors, you have either single pixels or a few tens of pixels. We can make arrays of many, many thousands of these pixels. And in fact, I'd argue that soon we'll be up to being able to make you know, a million pixels on a single array. Okay. And the way we do this is by tuning, being clever and tuning the, uh, as I said, the resonant frequency is related to the, the inductive part and the, uh, and the capacitive. And what we do is we tune the size of this capacitor. You can probably see over here between two sort of adjacent ones a change in the size of the capacitor. That changes the resonant frequency. And what we do then is we make a, a comb of all these tones, of all these uh, resonant frequencies, and that simultaneously addresses each one of these pixels. Okay, so we can simultaneously read out many thousands of pixels. Okay. And the way we do that is a, with a thing called software-defined radio. There are a few different implementations of this. This is one for an instrument I'll come back to in a minute called Darkness. Uh, but the general thing is, is basically you have very fast A to D, D to A converters that generate these uh, software tones, which are then mixed up to gigahertz frequencies and... Uh, and uh, irradiated by, the, by light from uh, within the cryostat. And it's those individual photon events then that we can, we can uh, observe. And then at the other end of it, you do the opposite. You, you take out all these individual uh, tones. You measure the, the phase shift between the input tone and the output. And that gives you a phase shift. And then you do a, um, a triggering so you can work out you know, when a single photon arrives and things like that. And you send an individual packet for a photon that has a measure of the time of arrival, you know, the photon energy, and other sort of housekeeping things about the background and, and things like that. Okay. So these do exist. Uh, I kid you not. Um, this was in 2011. This was the first MKID array that we took on Sky. This is with uh, Mazine Lab at uh, Ben Mazine at UC Santa Barbara was leading this. And uh, we went to Palomar to the 200 inch with this array that is 1,000 pixels. And basically we, did, we, we, took, um, we took observations of several astronomical observation, um, objects of interest, sorry. Uh, but also it was basically the first ever demonstration. Okay, and this is just to interest it, but you can see here, this is the potential QE of the system. Uh, this is probably an upper limit, let's say, because this, this is for various reasons, but, you know, we expect it to be uh, in the region of, um, you know, sort of around about 50%, 30 to 50% in the blue, going out to sort of 20%, and as you can see here, they're also uh, sensitive over a broad wavelength range as well. Okay. As I say, 2011, we took Archons to uh, Palomar, and there's a reference for that. <coughs> this was really the first demonstration camera of, uh, of this type, and uh, as I say, we did some science, but uh, really it was as a demonstration. The first real instrument based on this has gone on Sky recently, within the last couple of years. Again, this is Ben Mazine at UCSB, and... This is an instrument called Darkness, um, which, great name. Uh, but basically, this is for high contrast imaging of exoplanets. So what they did was they, used, they built an MKID camera with uh, 10,000 pixels, and they replaced the, uh, the integral field spectrograph on the uh, stellar double coronagraph uh, at Palomar and behind in the Palm 3K Extreme AO system. And they used this uh, to, to perform some of the first uh, observations with, with, uh, with a, an MKID. And some of the advantages of this, as you can imagine, is the increased sensitivity from having uh, no read noise. Uh, but also you can, you can hope to do some, some interesting things. This was the way it was called darkness was this so-called dark speckle technique, where basically statistically you, you, you look at the, uh, the occurrence of bright and dark speckles, and you can infer the existence or not of a... a a planet from that. Okay. This is just an idea of how kids sort of shape up. Even the current generation of kids will sort of shape up next to some of these other devices. And what this is really just trying to tell you, it show you is that, you know, in, in, in short frames, then, you know, because of the zero read noise in these detectors, even compared to the, you know, albeit very low read noise in these two, you, you still win. But it's really you start to win when you start to add lots and lots of frames together. And that's that effect of adding many frames with, with, uh, with read noise in them. Okay. 
uh, almost there. The, I just put up a quick slide to show you some of the, uh, the ongoing development and the next generation of sort of kids. Uh, as I say, this is looking towards the future now. Uh, and um, there's a lot of work going on in Europe and the US. These are really starting to gain some traction now. Um, a number of groups are, are springing up looking at these for different applications. Array size is, you know, we really, the ongoing development is focusing on these, uh, these different areas. The energy resolution is something that we want to improve, but it's not everything, actually. In other cases, you might want to go faster at the expense of energy resolution. Array size is important. Currently, the biggest array, as far as I'm aware of, is 30,000 <coughs> pixels, or maybe that should be spaxels, because you do also, for each one of those pixels, you have a spectrum, and for those, you have independent wavelength channels, so you can think of them as spaxels. Uniformity and yield, this is a process development uh, thing, but that's, uh, that is very, very important and will become more and more important as we try to get more and more pixels onto the arrays. And also the quantum efficiency improvements. At the moment, we, do, we have no anti-reflection coating on these or anything like that. So that QE that I showed earlier is really just the raw QE of the material. And there's a number, say there's a uh, sort of locally, if you like, there's a, um, a range of, uh, of institutes working on these. Okay, so I'll leave that one up. It's just a sort of summary. I think at the moment the, uh, the current detectors are sort of satisfying the majority of our needs, but as we move forwards into the era of the ELT especially, then you know, we're going to be pushing those to the limit and maybe beyond the limit, and uh, especially in some of these sort of you know, novel applications. So I hope that uh, maybe I've given you some... Uh, <coughs> indication of where I, I hope that the field might go. I think the superconducting detectors are, have reached a level of maturity now where they're starting to be considered for, for a number of different instruments. They've been on sky and they're starting to go on sky in sort of real instrumentations, not just technology demonstrators. Okay, I'll leave it there. Okay. What is it that limits the energy resolution of the detectors? Just looking at the pulse that you showed, my reaction to that is, oh, that must be better than 10%. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I think that, that one... Uh, that one may have been, actually. No, I may right, have cheated one. on that one. Yeah. But uh, really, is this, this, is this it? So it, it is the... Uh, this is the energy, this is the, um, so actually the intrinsic energy resolution of these devices could be up to 100 or 200. Right. Okay, and that depends on the, the, uh, the gap energy here, this delta, which is actually a function of the critical temperature of the superconductor. So if you go to lower critical temperature superconductors, this gap energy gets smaller, your maximum potential energy resolution goes up. Right. But okay. you have to go colder. Thank you. That's, that's the issue. Yeah, I was going to say one more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, two comments, a comment and a question. In your early table about different detectors, I think you've missed an important role, which is that of a CMOS image sensor, which fills a certain parameter space, especially for higher rate readouts. Yeah, I, I, I did realize that, and I nearly put it in, but I, I, at the moment, I haven't really seen them being used too much in astronomy. I think was okay, maybe well, my sort of consideration. This is my colleague's talk next. I didn't want um, to take all of your thunder. Yeah, no, but no. A, a question yeah. also on the MKID. Um, how critical is it? Presumably, you, have to, you operate them very cold and you stabilize the temperature. How critical is the stabilization of the temperature? Um, not particularly, yes. You have to get them very cold. The operating temperature of the devices that we use at the moment is around 80 millikelvin. Um, which sounds scary, but uh, is not actually as scary as it may sound. But within that, um, you can have small drifts, but, uh, but it is pretty easy nowadays to stabilize the temperature of the device. As you get to bigger and bigger arrays, it might get more of a challenge as the heat you're actually sort of dumping onto the array could have an issue in terms of sort of uniformity of temperature across it. But at the moment then, I don't think we've really seen any, uh, any issues with the temperature variations. Okay, well, can we thank Kieran again? Thank you.